Ladies and gentlemen, in person and online, it's my great privilege and pleasure to introduce Jim McKelvey. Uh, Jim is the co-founder of Square, a payments firm you might have heard of. Uh, also, more recently, the founder of Invisibly, which we'll talk about a little bit. He sits on the Federal Reserve Board in his hometown of St. Louis. Um, Jim, welcome to Accelerate. Thank you, Jim. Um, let me start by asking you to reflect a little bit. You launched Square in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 12 years have gone by. What do you think about the payment space, the fintech space? How has it changed during that period? And, where, and where, how do you think about it today compared to those days? Well, I still think it's kind of early days, but when we started Square, there was no fintech space. It was this idea that we had to solve a specific problem. And uh, we focused a lot of effort on solving that problem. And in the process, created this thing that people have now called fintech. So Square and maybe a handful of other firms were very, very early. PayPal. No, no. Actually, PayPal was, was there a decade earlier, but they hadn't done anything new in a decade. The interesting thing about PayPal was that, like, why doesn't PayPal do this? And we couldn't answer the question. And then so we did it. And then we thought, well, PayPal's going to copy us. And then they didn't. Like, it took PayPal a good, like, eight years to wake up and start copying Square, which they now do routinely. Um, but in terms of how the space is, I mean, you say early days, and I know what you mean, but a lot of capital has been created, a lot of companies have been created. Do you, I mean, you, you talk in your book, which we have copies of here, about the unfairness of the payments industry. Has that changed? Has it gotten better? It's gotten somewhat better. Um, it's, I mean, it used to be terrible for small merchants. It's, you know, Square's made it a lot better for small merchants. It's still pretty- Which you were. Which I was a small merchant, so I, I was a glass blower. Uh, still am actually. I make stuff nobody needs. Um, and in uh, trying to sell one of my pieces one day, uh, I lost a square. Uh, I lost a call. Or I'm sorry, I lost a sale because I couldn't take an American Express card, and that bothered me enough to call my friend Jack. And Jack and I had already agreed to start a company, um, but we didn't know what we were going to do. So I was like, Hey, instead of that thing that we sort of planned on doing, let's fix it so I can get paid. So that was the origin of Square. Um, what's happened since then is I think Square's done a lot on the merchant side, but I think there's still a lot more to do on the uh, individual side. So the unbanked, the underbanked, you know, people who are, um, you know, living sort of out of the realm of the traditional financial systems. And, and that was the case with the Square um, customer at the beginning. These were small businesses that were basically not participating fully in the way electronic commerce worked. So they aren't now all participating fully, but the people aren't. So we're still seeing a lot of potential with that. It's a really good point. And in fact, the next panel is about inclusion and fintech. So we'll definitely be addressing that. Maybe the critical moment in the book is when Amazon decides to get involved in your little business. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, that experience was what led me to write the book. Um, so the worst thing that can happen if you have a startup company is Amazon decides they want your business. So what they do, always the same, they copy your product, they undercut your price by 30%, they add the Amazon brand name, and you die. And that happened 100% of the time before Square. So we looked when Amazon was attacking us, we looked for other companies that had survived. There was zero survivors. Um, and so we did what we were already doing. We basically kept running the company. And amazingly, after about a year, Amazon quit. This had totally surprised us. But as surprised as I was and as happy as I was, I couldn't answer the question, what happened? Like, did we just get lucky? Because Amazon, Amazon just doesn't give up, all right? And the answer sort of led me down this path of research, which led to the book. So what I, was, what I then did was I said, well, Square can't be the only example of this phenomenon happening in human history. So I started researching and researching and researching. It took me almost two and a half years to find a peer group of other companies that had had the same phenomenon, which is little startups who would, you would expect to just get crushed by the incumbents or by the government or by some other very, very powerful institution. These, not only were these hard to kill, but they ended up then becoming the dominant companies in their field. And so I thought that was interesting. So that's what the book's about. The book is about this phenomenon that creates these, these massively successful companies, but in a way that's sort of foreign to most normal business practices. What's interesting about that is that 
you know, some of the companies that you look at include Southwest Airlines, IKEA, um, but those were th those were companies that entered into already existing businesses. What what makes Square stand out? It seems to me was there was really nothing like Square. Well, so so depends what you mean by existing businesses. The furniture business has been around for millennia, but affordable furniture that normal people could have was not around until IKEA started. Southwest air travel has been around since, you know, uh, Pan Am started flying those boat things, you know, but air travel until Southwest arrived was limited to rich people and people on expense accounts. And if you didn't have one of those, then you took the bus. So if you think about air travel, oh, it's been around a while, but, but air travel for everybody? No, that was Southwest. Furniture for everybody? No, that was Ikea. Banking for everybody? I mean, I profile... Um, the precursor to the Bank of America was originally called the Bank of Italy, but it was the first bank for every man. And Square, I mean, there was credit card processing before Square, but there was not credit card processing for the guy, you know, down at the taco. At the stand. farmer's market. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you, you call the book the innovation stack. Explain what that term means. So I, I had the, each of these companies had this thing, this messy thing that differentiated them from all their competitors and all the other companies in the market. And, and it was, it was not the way I had been taught innovation when I was, you know, studying and reading and, you know, sort of popular myth has it that innovation is sort of sort of spark of genius. And then people work on it. Um, it turns out to be this sort of messy iterative process, at least in the companies that I studied. And it was, it, it needed a name. So I, I came up, I coined this term innovation stack, which is this interlocking set of things you have to do. And I say have to, because the other interesting thing that I dis discovered when doing the research in the book is that none of the founders intentionally set off to be innovative. Their intention was survival. And they were forced into a situation where they couldn't copy. So, so let's talk about copying for just a second. Humans are great at copying. Uh, you're you're pro-copying. I am pro-copying. I am completely for, copy everything you possibly can. As a matter of fact, if you think innovation is like the first move, it, it almost never is. It's, it's the last resort. The, 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 the best thing you can do is find somebody who's had a similar problem and solved it and copy what they did. And by the way, that's why we're all here. That's how our DNA works. That's how, I mean, that's how this chair works. Like whoever invented what I'm sitting on right now, which is fine and not collapsing, like didn't invent seating. You know, they didn't even invent the polymers that were used to extrude this or the process that was used, you know, to, to I think this is ABS or something, but it's, it's, a, I mean, it's a typical chair, right? But it's made by Amazon. So, yeah, okay, there you go. Perfect. Um, I had a, uh, my, my former colleague, James Fallows, once wrote this wonderful sentence that I will mangle here, but it's something like, if there was such a thing as first mover advantage, I'd be writing this sentence on a K pro and you'd be reading it on a TRS 80. Amen. Baby. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so copy when you can, but there are weird times when you can't copy. And usually that's when you are doing something that nobody has ever done before. That's the classic example. But there are other times when for regulatory or other reasons, you are prevented from doing what everyone else does. So in Southwest Airlines case, they wanted to be a normal airline. They had a bunch of regulations thrown up that sort of forced them to be innovative in order to survive. They were basically locked in the state of Texas and they passed all these weird laws. And then Braniff was like blocking the fuel pumps so they couldn't refuel the jet. There was all sorts of crazy stuff that forced Southwest to do things differently. It wasn't that they chose to, it was what they were forced to. And that forced to was the big insight because, you know, we, we typically think of these entrepreneurs who built these super innovative companies as some, some sort of, you know, bold survivor, visionary, I think stuff like that. In most cases, they're just normal folks in really dire straits. Yeah. Um, when you, when you think about uh, one of the, goals of, of today's conference is to think about where fintech is headed, where, where's the innovation going to come from? Um, you know, you're, you're both outside the space, but now you're back inside the space. Um, do you think that the, the, that the big, the next big steps come from 
innovation in technology or is it innovation in marketing? Where you know we we had the presentation from Corporate Insight was that a lot of a lot of the tech that's catching on with with companies like Chime et cetera is not particularly hard to produce. So so where do you think the the next innovations are going to come from? Probably from outside the industry. Probably from somebody that doesn't think of themselves as a fintech. Because if you think of yourself as a fintech or you define yourself in any industry, you immediately inherit all the restrictions and adhesions of that industry. So the fact that Square entered the fintech world before there was a fintech world allowed Jack and me to do a bunch of things that were kind of crazy in hindsight. We broke, I think I counted like 17. Yeah, I remember you saying yeah. like there's 17 laws about credit cards and you broke all Laws and rules and regulations to KYC. And all. Like when we built our first working prototype, and I think I actually stopped counting at 17, but it was this pile of, you know, soon to be legal actions where we were just breaking rules. Um, you wouldn't do that today. Right. What you do is you'd go to a VC who's funded other, you know, 12 other similar fintechs. Oh, and by the way, I have one like FinTop. We fund, we have a formula. We just rinse and repeat, like nothing creative there. It's just the point is to make money. Um, but the, the, advantage of being in an industry that doesn't exist is that you are not bound by any existing ideas. And so fintech's going to make a lot of money. Their formulas now, I would say, copy those formulas, run those formulas, but you're probably not going to get, you know, a 10,000 X return on one of those formulas. Interesting. Um, let me shift gears a little bit, because as I mentioned, you, uh, for the last couple of years, sit on the Federal Reserve of uh, St. Louis. Um, there's been a, a lot of Fed, um, I don't want to say alarms, but let's say alerts uh, regarding stablecoin. Um, and for, for those who aren't paying uh, close attention to this, a stablecoin is a cryptocurrency that is denominated to a, an existing government currency, a fiat currency. Um, uh, the, the ones that are pegged to the US dollar, Tether is the largest. Um, these have grown tremendously in value to, and are essentially unregulated because they're not, the producers of, of, of uh, stable coins are not registered as banks. Um, they are, are probably taking up a space previously occupied by money market funds. This worries people on the Fed. Yes. And I'm just curious like what that looks, what that conversation looks like where you sit. So the most interesting thing that I saw about three years ago, I was in, uh, I was walking through Manhattan and Gemini had an ad on a bus. So Gemini is a crypto exchange and run by the Winklevoss. Yes. Twins. Yeah. So the twins, right? Of course. Um, but what they were ever like the regulated crypto exchange. In other words, they were bragging about the fact that they, among all, you know, other crypto exchanges actually had somebody regulating them. Now, how regulated and all that stuff we can get into. But the point is, they were bragging about the fact that, you know, if you, the implication there is trust Gemini because we at least have one adult who's auditing us. <laughs> right. And look, uh, there are a lot of adults at the Federal Reserve, and our mission is to keep the economy running well. And so regulation is an essential part of that. And if you don't have trust in the financial system or if you don't trust how your money is, moving, uh, then commerce freezes up. So yeah, it's a very serious issue. We take it very seriously and we have some brilliant people working on it. Can't tell you exactly what's going to happen, but- um, So what's going to happen? Yeah, that would be interesting. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll tell so, you- So uh, let's, uh, let's go into it a little yeah. bit. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not asking you to tell tales out of school exactly, uh, although if you could, that would be great. Um, but you know there are different there are different approaches, right? So it has it has been floated. I don't think it's been officially stated, but it has been floated to have a rule that if you issue stablecoin, you have to register as a bank. You have to like become a bank, which is kind of a big deal. Yeah, uh, and quite different from the way things operate now. Is that the best approach? Should we treat stablecoins as a security and regulate it through the SEC? So you've got two viable avenues there. Either one will work. I mean, it does, and, and it, like I'm not going to get into sort of the details of regulation, but regulation generally is good at the beginning of these, uh, you know, value exchanges. And if you think that governments are going to allow unregulated uh, currencies to exist, take a look at China. Right, right. Um, 
You know, I interviewed you in December of last year, and I, I went back and I looked at the questions, and I was like, "Could you believe Bitcoin's at twenty thousand dollars? This is out of control." And today, the I think of the last I looked, it's at fifty six thousand um, dollars. Where do you see crypto going? I'm not looking for a number, but but are we are we at the early stages of of the crypto revolution? Is it going to uh, is it going to crash and burn? Like, what? How do you think about it? Are you invested in crypto? So, I mean, indirectly, mostly, and then directly to a tiny amount. Um, I am not as big a crypto fan as uh, my partner, but here's the thing that I'm questioning, which is what is the government response? And so that was your previous question, and I conveniently didn't answer it. Um, not that I could have, right? If I knew, then I'd be way better dressed. Um, it's Governments tend to take a dim view of not controlling the land and not controlling the money. And if you think you own the land under your house, try not paying your taxes. Just give it a shot. See who owns it. Um, governments right now are confronted with this thing that's very hard to fight, which is Bitcoin, which is decentralized. So they can't just you know subpoena or bomb some sort of central entity. Right. I mean, yeah. Nigeria tried this. They banned uh, Bitcoin. And as far as anybody can tell, Bitcoin uh, transactions in Nigeria have like tripled. Yeah. So it's, it's very difficult to squash this out. But I mean, the governments are not out of moves. So the question is, what are those moves and how are they likely to come in? And I think you're going to see some, you know, some responses from, uh, from a lot of governments. And I don't know what those responses are going to look like. The history of government coming in to regulate something is that they tend to overregulate it. So if we want history as a guide, I would bet on sort of overregulation of uh, these things by people who basically don't understand how they work. Well, that that's interesting because one of the possible paths, it seems to me, is that the United States government issues some kind of central bank digital currency. Yeah. This is a, a a hot topic in in other countries. I think you know three quarters of all the central banks in the world are, are studying the problem. We're supposed to have a report out from the government, I thought last month, but um, we haven't seen it yet. Um, do, do you think that's a possibility? And what impact do you think that would have on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? So Bitcoin, again, is sort of an outlier because there's no central entity. Um, but anything that can be regulated probably will be regulated. And a central bank digital currency, I think, is, I mean, it's, it's on the roadmap for most major countries. Oh, we're looking at it. Yeah. Um, let's switch gears yet again, because uh, I would like to know more about your new company um, called Invisibly, which is not maybe directly, I don't know that I would call it a fintech, but it is in the payment space. No, it's, no, it's not. Uh, it's in a space that has never worked. So, and Invisibly is God, it's almost five years old now. So I was recruited by a bunch of media companies. So it's in the media space. And I was recruited by a bunch of media companies uh, to help them save their businesses. Because as you know, I mean, you're in the media. A little too well. Yeah, right. So um, there's, there's a big problem. So quality used to be brought to us by the fact that the channels were expensive. So if the printed page costs you money or the broadcast signal costs you money, then there's competition to have that space have, you know, have that program broadcast. And therefore the program or the article has to be of a certain quality, otherwise it doesn't make the paper or it doesn't make the broadcast. So because that space is limited, then advertising is at a premium because advertising basically has to displace good content. So the advertising has to be expensive and therefore expensive ads gives money to, so we can hire great journalists and the whole thing works. Or I should say worked because it stopped working when we took the constraints off and said, oh, hey, on the internet, you can publish anything for free and you can, you know, make your own videos and like the, the cost effectively went to zero and this supply went to infinity. And what happened was then a destruction of a model that brought us quality. So there are only three ways to make money in media. Well, I guess you can have the BBC own you. That's maybe the fourth or Bezos. Okay. So big, rich, central entity owning everything. But basically, if it's not that, it's subscriptions ads or pay-per-view, and pay-per-view has never worked. Subscriptions is only working in the United States, or only working in the English language for five publications. Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, 
Economist and the Financial Times make enough money off their subscriptions to kind of stay around. The rest of you are, are supported by advertisements. And the advertising model has a couple of basic problems. Um, one is that advertising, like the whole ad, the, the, the whole sort of efficiency of the programmatic ecosystem is just a disaster. 90% of the revenue is lost. And the other problem is that it works sort of against the interests of all of us as individuals. So you sell your attention by watching something and then while you're wanting to, you know, talk to James, I'm going to sit here and like block him. <laughs> so you, like, you got to like, I'm going to tell you about my glassware. You should go buy more fancy glassware. You know, like I'm going to, I'm going to take away the thing you want with an advertisement. And that's, that's the model. So this is crap. Um, the solution, unfortunately, has never worked. And it's micropayments. It's the ability to make tiny, tiny little um, payments. So, so in other words, what you do is you say, well, I want all my media to be free. And I say, okay, let's make it free. As long as you'll trade me your attention for free, I'll give you your media for free. And that's kind of the trade you're making now, but let's make it efficient. Okay. And the way to make it efficient is I give you an agent. So I have an agent. He books my speaking things. He makes sure you guys all have to buy these books. Like, and my agent negotiates for me. And when I want to sell my services, if I want to sell myself, you know, as a speaker at a conference or, or something, my agent negotiates that deal. So you should have a little agent too, except that when you want to watch an ad, that agent should say, well, um, not during the middle of this thing that he wants to do, but how about tonight when he's waiting at an airport, you can have five minutes of my client's time. Your agent should go out there and negotiate on your behalf with your consent. And conversely, that agent should buy for you. So if you want to read news or in, in, you know, pull down anything. It doesn't have to be news. It can be entertainment. Your agent should be negotiating those purchases as well. I.e., why are you paywalled off from an article you want to read? Like I know people that want to read articles, can't read them, and it's not because it's the five bucks. It's the complete pain in the ass to sign up for another service and have your. your I'm seeing this poor guy. Reading. I mean, this, I, I, we should just like focus the camera on his face because that that <laughs> face that he's making the audience is like, yeah, man, I could probably have to in the last week, right? That's exactly the problem. And we so invisibly is the agent. Invisibly is a little invisible. And agent. you take a cut like an agent. Yeah, of course. We're yeah. good agents. Yeah. Uh, well, it sounds fascinating. And Jim, I could talk to you all afternoon. I, I would like to open the floor to questions because we have a couple minutes left. Uh, any in the room or do we have any on the in the Q&A? David? That. So, I mean, I've known Jack for uh, since he was 15. He started working for me at a company that I actually still have, but he no longer works there. Um, look, uh, Jack is a brilliant guy. And uh, when he was working for us, this was in the early 90s, we called him Jack the Genius. He is, his name was, his name, his name at the company was Jack the Genius. And uh, by the time he was 16, I had him managing a team for me. Um, he's grown since then. Uh, but, you know, Jack speaks for himself these days. So I can tell you the old stories, but I mean, I would just say that, you know, he's, he's, of the people who I've seen who have his level of influence and power, uh, I think he's one of the better people to have that. Like I trust Jack to make good decisions for us all. Would, would that there were more like him. Um, I think we need to move on to our next panel, uh, please. Oh, we have a question, very quick. Oh yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, we're still trying to figure it out. I won't claim that it works. I mean, you can go to invisibly.com and try and you might be scratching your head going, what? This is, yeah. But it theoretically, look, here's the thing about micropayments. It's never worked. But a lot of things never worked. Like it was never possible to land a rocket upright until Elon, you know, 
said, well, I'm going to do it until I, until I stick the landing. He finally figured out how to land the damn rocket straight up. You know, you can figure it out. It is, it is according to me and 14 economists at the Federal Reserve, possible to do this. Can we do it? Well, we might not be the right team, but it is possible. And if it works, it's better for everybody. I feel confident you're going to figure it out. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Jim McKelvey. Thank you, Jim.